The other thing, and I'll be right there, that I really don't like is incredibly unattractive men who somehow have managed to convince the women that the women just know that these guys are actually much more attractive than they actually are and, and that they should be attracted to them. It's like, no, you're a loser and she should never be attracted to you. Go write some other thing. Just don't give me that fantasy. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> well, people have, people have to behave like normal people. Um, I suppose, like you say, sometimes you, making characters act unrealistically under the circumstances to, to, to meet your plot needs is unfair and not believable, and people won't go along with it. Yeah. On the other hand, the converse might be true, is that how many times, well, there's a good example in Frozen. The bad guy turns out to be the handsome, hands, the, uh, handsome guy in The Prince. He's, you know, that was going against grain. You thought the guy, the, the uh, ambassador from Weaselton, was yeah. going to be the bad guy. He was an asshole, but he wasn't the bad guy. Yeah. You know, that was clever. That was a clever plot. Right? Well, and also, true love wasn't romantic. It was sisterly love. Yeah. Was sisterly yes, love. Mm -hmm. which is a, a big twist for Disney. Yeah, yeah. They've done that one before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, of course, part of that also shows that you have to you have to let your plot and your story go where it's supposed to go and where it naturally leads. Disney, in the original version of the, the Disney movie as it started and in the Hans Christian Andersen story it's based on the Ice Queen is the villain. Mm -hmm. But they were already on the bubble and then, you know, if you don't know the story, when that the uh, songwriter did the song Let It Go and Disney said, okay, that's really good. We're going to have to change our plot points though. <laughs> is that when they, is that yeah. when they... No, they actually it? said that. This is, as we were moving... The thing is, I didn't realize it's so clear. And when you're making the movies like this, you do the, you do the songs first. Because you have to integrate the movie around the songs. So the songs are first, and the lady did this really great song. Yeah. They instantly recognized and said, wow, we lucked out. We got a really good song. This is a great tune, and it's Elsa's song. We are going to have to rewrite it. And that's, and that's a lot of the point. So, you know, I don't know about you, but you know, some, I've written stories where it didn't end up where it was going. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. You know, I was especially unhappy one time when I did a story, and I had a character in it who was a newspaper editor. And by the end of the story, he was a bad guy. <laughs> but uh, that's unfortunately the way the story went, and I had to realize that there can be a situation where a person in my position can be the bad guy. My, my daughter was eight when she saw it, and she loves the Snow Queen. And when she found out that, that this, this was an adaptation of the Snow Queen, she said, yeah, it was just like the Snow Queen. They had snow. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, Disney had to change the story, too, to follow naturally. And you do that yeah. in the story. You, you, you just can't beat your characters into submission. You have to let them go. I've just been... You have to let them go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it will never leave your head. <laughs> you know, I, I just finished writing my first stab at a, at a novel, which I'm, I'm having proof right now I'm going to be submitting soon. And I stuck in a character there who I meant to be a bad guy in, initially. And as it naturally flows, he ends up being a sympathetic character. Um, but that's just the way it went. The bad guy still stayed the bad guy, but this was supposed to be another bad guy. And you, you just can't go in there with preconceived notions. If you're good and your creativity flows and your plot hangs together, you have to let the characters be their own characters. The characters assume life of their own. We've all heard, you know, fantasy stories about characters coming to life, you know, and stepping into your world. Well, even Rod Serling did that, an episode of Twilight Zone about that. Hank Hart. Yeah. So, uh, you know. No, I've, I know that... Uh I've sold a series of short stories that were also an episodic novel, and one character was supposed to be there for just one transitional scene to get some information that I wouldn't have had otherwise, and the guy never left. <laughs> His job was seven pages long, and he's like, no, I think I'll hang out for about 180 pages. <laughs> Every time I took him out, everything bogged down, and it stunk, and I find some in. When, uh, Kristen, when you're plotting a, a, a mystery and you're trying to do keep up the suspense, how do you how do you sustain that, especially in relation to the character, not having a character tip their hand too early? Or well, what I did for the mystery in the anthology that's coming out, and hopefully this is not a spoiler for anybody, if you decide to buy Virginia's for Mysteries Two, is I took um, a dual POV. So I had my amateur sleuth who was a student at Wayne and Mary, and then I had flashbacks to the actual murder from the murderer's point of view. And so what I did was in different scenes, I showed the murder unfolding, simultaneously slicing in 
her, the, my protagonist, modern day, uncovering things as she naturally would within the story, and they were the clues, kind of as they were, they were threading the clues through with the murder as it was happening, but you don't know who the murderer is until the very end, because I told it in first person. So that's how I did it. I mean, you're still finding out at the end who murdered the victim. You know that there was a body from the beginning, but I didn't, um, it's not revealed until the very last moment of the story, 5,000 words later. So. This person keeps trying to oh, ask yeah. well, the question. No, it's just the issue with pacing, and I think it is different for mysteries, and uh, Kristen and I are in the Virginia, it's the, the Sisters in Crime Mysteries, that for, for Lou, who's, who's written so many, and for Warren, who's read so many short stories, for those of us who are just trying to get better in our craft, it's a little different, and just with the issue of pacing, we, we come to that, like, you know, you start and you think you have something good and then we share it in a critique group and it's like, no, this is bogged down and no, you need to do this and, you know, that we have writers who actually make their living writing, which she and I don't yet. And so it just the whole pacing with the mystery story, you think it would be easy because you have, you know, different different suspects and you have the, you know, looking for means, motive and opportunity. And, but if you, if you look for that for each character and it's just a list, check, 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 you know, that's horrible. I mean, and that's not pacing. So it's something that we, you really, you have, you have to learn and that you have to recognize. So for, if you're writing and if you're writing as a new writer, you know, it really takes some working at it to see. And, you know, for the experts who've been doing it for a long time, they can see it like that. But, you know, the, the pacing is really something to learn and that, you know, it has to rise and a little bit of fall and then rise again and you've got to have another grab and, you know, it's it's not easy, and with a mystery, you would think it would be easy, but uh, you know, it, it's not. <laughs> well, usually, in a short story, you just have one. You know, it's pretty. A lot of times, it's one general s story arc. Now, there may be a few little plateaus along the way. It's very different in the novel and My uh, the advantage I have as a as a background as a as a newspaper reporter is I know how to write the English language, so I don't make mm -hmm. grammatical mistakes or structural mistakes. Would you be surprised how they creep into stories? The problem is, of course, writing a newspaper story is the absolute opposite of writing a fiction story because a newspaper story, you better say in the first sentence what the story is. It's supposed to be tapered off to the end. That's just a practical effect of newspaper layout. I have to be able to tell someone, if you're fitting a story into the layout, cut it from the end. It, yeah. the, it, it is unusual to say this story can't be cut, but let me know if the story has to be cut. I, you have to front load it all. Well, you can't do that in a and short cut story. one paragraph at a time until it fits. Yeah, I remember that from my newspaper days. Yeah, the, the, the way it was explained to me, you know, by my hometown newspaper that was growing up, is it's like a dragon, you chop it from the end, you chop it from the tail, you know, <laughs> going forward. And so that's the total opposite of the story. Now, if you get to a story and you paste it just right in the end, and when you get to the end, it is the end, and it works, then, then you know you did it. One thing I like to do is when I do a first draft of a short story, I write out a first draft. You know, you've all heard the expression, write like crap and edit brilliantly. <laughs> Bang out the first draft, get it out of the way. It's like baking something, let it cool down, come back to it later. If I reread it and I, rem I don't remember a scene, it's probably, in my experience, not needed. If it's not, it didn't advance the plot, I don't remember it well enough that when I read it a second time, it seems new to me. That's probably a place you need to cut. On the other point, on the other side, hand, if I read something the second time and all of a sudden I realize it doesn't make sense, that's where you need to put the words back in that you picked up when you cut out the scene that you didn't need in the first place. <laughs> now, you, you're mentioning the news story. I do sometimes reject stories to tell them what you've given me here is an event. It's not a story. A thing happened, but you don't tell me why it's important, how it changes the people who are involved. This thing just happened. You gotta give me a why. Why do I care? And if that isn't there, it isn't a story. Sometimes you have to realize that you may not have a plot, you may have a conceit, which may be the basis of a flash. I, I attended an event actually once, a speedboat drag race. You get to drag races with speedboats, and it was one in East Texas, and I had this idea, and it just occurred to me, and then I just wrote it up as a flash, and, and a guy who wants to see a speedboat drag race, but it's in the Caribbean, and some guy tells him he can get him, show him a special, a really special event if he greases his palm with silver, so he does. And they do you a speedboat, uh, a speedboat race uh, in the, in the Caribbean. But uh, the name of the uh, the name of the key, Atlantis Key, is a tip is a tip off. And when the boats are lined up ready to do the speedboat, a mermaid comes out of the water with a green seaweed in one hand and red seaweed in.